a warrior, a strategist, a diplomat and a queen. Known for her fight to keep Angola independent from the Portuguese, she was a key figure in the 17th century world. In this episode of Humble History, we'll dive deep into the life of Queen Njinga of Angola. Let's get into it right now. The year is 1583 and we are in the kingdom of Ndongo, part of what is today Angola. Ndongo was a relatively new country. It was less than 100 years old at the time and for most of its existence it was in constant battle with an invading force. Portugal. Decades earlier, Portuguese troops had arrived by the call of the Ndongo king. Although they initially helped Ndongo expand its territories, it became apparent that their main motivation was to take land and slaves for themselves. This conflict led to a decades-long war between the two countries, and it was in this war that Njinga was born. Njinga grew up watching her father, the king of Ndongo, constantly fighting the Portuguese. When she became old enough, she joined the battles. She was famous as a soldier and a strategist, and particularly renowned for her use of the battle axe, the symbolic weapon for Ndongo. However, after years of battle, the Portuguese defeated her father's army, and the king was killed in battle. Njinga's brother ascended to the throne as the new king. Her brother saw his ascension to the throne as fragile, and to avoid any challenges, he ensued a bloodbath on his relatives. His half-brother, his half-brother's imprisoned mother, and all of her siblings were killed in short order. He then went on to murder prominent members of the court along with their families. Then he went on to his sisters, ordering the sterilization of Njinga and her two younger sisters. Oils combined with herbs were thrown while boiling onto the bellies of his sisters so that from the shock, fear, and pain, they should forever be unable to give birth. Finally, he killed his nephew, Njinga's young son. Meanwhile, the Portuguese kept escalating their attacks and taking more land and slaves with them. The new king, wanting to avoid the fate of his father, decided to negotiate a peace deal. For this, the king sends his sister, Njinga, as his ambassador. At this point, Njinga had been living in the neighboring states of Matamba. As you might expect, she hated her brother for what he had done. But she never gave up her dream of seeing Ndongo in his former glory and independent of his Portuguese occupants. Njinga agrees and sets off the Portuguese base. This negotiation is where Njinga would make her name in Ndongo and begin consolidating power for herself. However, she knew that getting to an agreement was going to be difficult. The Portuguese had a reputation for humiliating African nobles whenever they came to their base. To avoid this, it was important to Njinga that she make a strong first impression. At her request, The king provided a large entourage for her journey. Every person on her path would have seen or heard about her voyage, of the hundreds of attendants by her side, and the sight of slaves carrying the royally dressed Lady of Ndongo on their shoulders as they make the 200-mile journey to the Portuguese base. The act that would have made her famous among her people and the Portuguese was what would happen next. When she arrives at the court of the governor, she is offered no seat and is expected to sit on the floor. This was a common humiliation technique that the Portuguese would use. However, Njinga refused to lower herself and had prepared a power play of her own. She called to one of her attendants, who on command sat on the floor with her hands and knees, making a human chair. Njinga sat on her attendant, making it at equal level with the governor and conducted the meeting this way. After long hours of discussion, upon escorting Njinga from the negotiation room, the governor pointed out that the young attendant was still on her hands and knees on the floor. Njinga dismissed the governor's concern. She had not forgotten her attendant at all, she explained. She had left her there deliberately. An envoy of her status who represented a kingdom such as hers should never have to sit on the same chair twice. After all, she remarked, she had many others just like it. By the end of her first diplomatic mission, she had secured her brother's term with the Portuguese. Both sides would stop the attacks, and any slaves that the Portuguese claim to their own would be returned. Both parties agreed to work together to fight off common enemies. When the governor and his council continued to question her brother's dedication to peace, Njinga showed her commitment by agreeing to be baptized as a Catholic. She was given the name Donna Anna. On her return, her brother publicly celebrated his sister's accomplishment in the capital. 
Njinga was no longer seen only as a skilled warrior, but also as a successful diplomat. However, in the following years, the Portuguese break their agreement. Not only did they not support the king in his fight against foreign forces, but they kept increasing their own military presence in Ndongo. The king eventually lost control of his capital and had to flee to a royal island fortress. This put him in a deep depression and banished any Portuguese missionary from his court. He sent his seven-year-old son in hiding with a mercenary leader called Casa. Isolated from the Portuguese and losing control of most of Ndongo, the king died of unknown causes. Some speculate it was suicide, others think he was poisoned. Regardless of what the cause was, it resulted in Njinga ascending the throne and becoming queen of Ndongo. Her brother picked Njinga to succeed him, but she felt that she needed to do more to consolidate her power. She held a customary election among her court that confirmed her as leader, as well as secured the endorsement of religious officials. She led a campaign against those who opposed her, including members of her family, and she was keen on getting her seven-year-old nephew. She tracked down the mercenary leader Casa, and she convinced him to marry her in a royal wedding and to give over her nephew. As the wedding began, she avenged her son's death and killed her nephew, throwing his body into the Kwanzaa River. And before the wedding was over, all attendants suspected of being opposed to Njinga were murdered. Although her actions led to some of her supporters to flee, many of the people stayed loyal. They regarded Njinga as the legitimate ruler of Ndongo, and her murderous acts did not change their view. Once consolidating her power as queen, she offered land and freedom to any runaway slaves. She sent messengers all over the country announcing that any noble or slave serving under the Portuguese is welcome in her kingdom and will be given land to work on and live on. This led to the first popular revolt in Ndongo since the Portuguese arrived, threatening the very foundation on which Portuguese economic and political strength and gold are rested. Meanwhile, reinforcements are sent from mainland Portugal with enough men and resources to attack Njinga in a full-scale war. After two months of combat, the Portuguese overcame Njinga's forces, destroying her fortress and even taking her sister captive. Njinga, however, managed to escape and took refuge among her supporters. Seeing that more and more of her nobles had been forcibly taken by the Portuguese, Njinga decided to change strategies and use guerrilla warfare. In the coming decade, Njinga led her forces from one victorious campaign to another, eventually conquering lands that the Portuguese had formerly claimed. And after 10 years of this strategy, a new unexpected player enters the scene. The Dutch. The Dutch threatened to take the Portuguese control of Angola for themselves. Njinga and the Dutch have very opposite intentions for Angola, but they became allies to fight their off their common enemy. Securing the people's loyalty through her Ndongo lineage, and by extending her control through Dutch support, Njinga stretches her base in the next seven years, from conquering all of Matamba and reclaiming parts of Ndongo. In the previous decades, Njinga went from being a queen with no land and no army to controlling land in two kingdoms and sporting an army of 80,000 strong. After seven years of battles, the Dutch, Njinga's strongest ally, abandoned their mission in Ndongo. However, at this point, Njinga had enough power of her own to enforce the firm political control established in Matamba and the lands between Matamba and Ndongo. These lands were the primary source of slaves for the Portuguese and gave Njinga a strategic advantage. The Portuguese were now forced to reopen political relations with Njinga to resolve the slave trade question. After long negotiations, the Portuguese submitted to recognize the new kingdom of Ndongo Matamba and create a peace with his queen and even released Njinga's sister. To maintain her advantage, Njinga initiated direct relations with the Capuchins, a religious order whose missionaries would come to serve her as political intermediaries not only with Portuguese governors in Angola, but with higher officials in Europe as well. Njinga also pushes to have Catholicism to be the main binding ideology in her new kingdom. She even began a correspondence with the Vatican and receives recognition from the Pope, the official Catholic status of Matamba. Nearing the end of her life, and with no children of her own, she picked her sister to succeed her as queen. After a lifetime of war, Njinga died peacefully at the age of 82. Njinga's courage, strategic movements, and patriotism made her a hero in Angola where she is celebrated to this day. And across the Atlantic, her story and memory were kept by the Africans taken to the Americas. To quote historian Linda M. Haywood, 
Injinga demands to be presented as the complex human being that she was and given her rightful place in world history. That is it for this episode of Humble History. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button. It helps us a lot. If you want to keep up with future episodes, make sure to subscribe and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss a thing. Comment below and join the conversation. For our long-time viewers that want to support us, you can join our Patreon and support us for as long as $1 a month. I've been your host, Adam Salu. This episode was co-produced by Timbal Nagasho, and the cover art was done by Wayne Digital Arts. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode.